So I guess my, my first question is, um, how did the film come about? How, how did the film end up getting made? Well, the film, People of the Seal, um, came about through actually the cleanup project. The, the federal government had to come back to the Pribilof Islands, clean up uh, after an industry that they had maintained on the islands for a number of years. And uh, in the process of cleaning up, the program manager decided he needed to leave, like, leave a living legacy, a little bit of history. So he secured other funds uh, to produce this film and also to publish some books. And how did you how did you get involved in it? What? Um, I guess I'm an avid history maintainer for the Pribilof Islands. It's always been a passion of mine, and I have been uh, involved in previous interviews. Um, and the program manager, uh, John Lindsay, found it in his heart to involve me and ask me if I would be a part of the film. Uh, and that's one reason. The other reason is my family was easy to trace. And my family history is very similar, if not the same, as how most people ended up on the Pribilof Islands. So those are the two main reasons I ended up being uh, blessed to do this project. And if you could tell one people, what, what, do you, what do you hope that people take away from the movie after seeing it? What do you, what do you hope that they leave feeling? After people watch People of the Seal, of course, I want them to know our history of the Pribilof Islands. I would like them to use it as a tool to avoid ever having that happen to any group of people where they become used in a slave labor force for some type of industrial development. The other thing I would like for people to learn is how uh, much of a role the Pribilof Islands played in the purchase of the state of Alaska. There is so much more history for people to delve into it. It's almost just like a tip of the iceberg uh, to watch that film. And the further you go in, quite fascinating uh, bits of stories and history. Mm -hmm. and, and it does seem like there are a lot of cultures. There's, there's the native Alaskan cultures, there's the Russian culture, everything kind of converged there in the Pribilof Islands. How do you feel, how does that still linger? How, do, how does that effect still linger even today? Um, it's interesting because we have like sort of three cultures that have come into play. We have a traditional indigenous culture that was um, um, introduced by people coming in, the Russian culture. And then, uh, so you have a merging of those two cultures. And once people become c comfortable with it, you have now this American culture that comes in. And so they're all just overlapping and weaving together. And it's very hard to separate them. It is pretty unique. Uh, all those cultures coming together in this, these two communities that have been there now for a couple hundred years, uh, post-contact, um, our names um, are some of our traditional practices. The Russian Orthodox uh, Church is quite prevalent and strong and very well respected on the Pribilof Islands. Um, and then we, I think sometimes there is a struggle to figure out how do you have one exist parallel to the other and where do you merge them and where do you sometimes just say, okay, I'm just going to leave this one. Um, it's really interesting and it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next hundred years. That is something that, that, is, that is kind of fascinating is how the history that we've all, we've all read or we all are familiar with, how is that in your mind, how do you think that's going to change moving forward when, when children a hundred years from now are reading about now? What do you think that will be the thing that kind of sticks out the most in terms of the, the cultural heritage that, that's being passed along? One of the things, it, it, it is a struggle right now to keep the Unangan culture uh, going. And I think we have to become pretty savvy at using technology to keep it alive. That's our true test right now. Um, I am hoping that 100 years from now, children in that uh, time frame will still have all three ways of existing and, and ways of knowing their Unangan um, land-based culture along with this now foreign um, when we think of Russia and then this American culture that we just happen to now be citizens of that they bring them all together and develop something that's the best for humankind in general that there isn't pitting one culture against another and I think that for us 
uh, we can either consider it a blessing or a curse, but I would like to hope that they would consider it a blessing. There's the scenes in the movie that I thought were so powerful were the comparisons between in the older footage of the seals where there are just those fur seals as far as the eye can see. And now to, to someone who's never seen anything like that, it still seems like there are so many. But the sound, it sounds like it's just it's just incredible. I can imagine it's so overwhelming. How does that when the seals show up, I guess my question is, is does that signify what does that mean to the people on the islands when they start to come back? Is that sort of like when the seagulls show up in Anchorage, we know it's finally going to get warm, you know, <laughs> like. Probably similar thing. Um, the seals um, are, in our traditional beliefs, other life species are your brethren in a sense. They're not one above the other. So we approach, we came into the present day society with that and it gets challenged. Um, and fur seals were not traditional to us as Unangan people. We were on the Aleutians and we saw them passing through the Aleutian Islands, but now we live with them and we live in their home. And we came to caretake for them in the belief of our, our stories and our ancestors. Um, when they come every year, there is, um, it's like a homecoming mm -hmm. for ourselves. Every, even if we've been there, you know, through the winter, their coming back is a home, homecoming for those of us that live there. And they, you start to hear the sounds uh, increase, you start to smell them. <clears throat> and so, um, I don't know, it is, it is that it's a homecoming, it's a feeling of homecoming. Do you, do you get a lot of people that come in, in those months to see it? Or is it a pretty, I mean, I guess do you get a lot of tourism? We have visitors that come to the Pribilof Islands um, right now to see the birds. Mm. And uh, the Purple Off Islands are also known for the, the birds. The fur seals uh, are sort of like take second stage to the seabirds, but I think that we need to market uh, tourism better in order to have people come to see the fur seals. And I think we will come, come into that. Interestingly, we've only been an independent community since 1983. Mm -hmm. So as a free American city, that's when our freedom actually started. Um, and I think that we need to tell our story uh, in such a way that it draws people to come out and see the fur seals because it is quite fascinating. I can look out my kitchen window and watch fur seals in the summer out on a beach in, a, in the not so distant uh, shoreline. So for me, you know, I, I really appreciate that. I really enjoy and feel blessed that I can do that and people should come and see them. And do you think, what, what, what do people normally say, like from, for a person who's never been out to the islands like that, or what, what is their usual initial reaction to mm -hmm. being on the island with you? <laughs> I think there might be different things that people will react to when they come to the Pribilofs. You have someone that has not had um, the sound of fur seals and the sight of fur seals in their growing up years or at whatever point they have come to the Pribilofs. Um, when they see them, they go, wow, there's a lot of seals, but there aren't a lot of seals. And that's a sad thing for someone like myself, who's born on the Purple Offs, lived there all of my life. Um, it is quite alarming to see the numbers going down. That's where we need to become better at having humans in general understand what is too much, what is too little, what have we impacted, and without just, uh, without counting, because visually, it's a whole different thing than how you imagine numbers in your, in your mind. Um, so some of the stuff is we're teaching children. How do you look at that particular beach and guesstimate how many seals are on them? Um, some people might say, oh, there's, there looks like there are like 200 seals, and there really are 2,000. And it's so hard to visually imagine it sometimes. So yeah, I guess now I am curious. So what, what, what is that smell that you referred to? Like, well, when you watch People of the Seal, it is wonderfully done. I mean, everyone that was involved did such a wonderful job, but you cannot smell and you can't physically feel the crisp sea breeze and smell it and smell the seals. I don't, for myself, uh, one of the things that I remember my departed mom for is her scent. And for me, when I go places, First thing I do is take a breath of air, and there is something about the Pribilof Islands and that Bering Sea breeze 
that people miss it when they leave. People that leave and they're gone for 20 years, they will say, I miss that smell. I don't know what it is, but yeah. Well, and then there's one thing to smell all the seals on the rookery and you grow accustomed to it, but some people might wrinkle their nose at first. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, there, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about in, in terms of the movie or, or of your home that you think our viewers would like to, like to know? Or? Um, one of the uh, things about the Pribilof Island that seems to hold true for everyone that comes to visit is that when they leave, they take with them a longing to return. And um, one of the first uh, stories we have of our people coming to the Pribilof Islands and naming it Tana Amih was that he left with a longing to return and that's why we are back there. Um, so people just need to come and they just need to come and see it and, and you, you, you won't know until you actually come and see that. With that little break there, the other thing that I want to say is uh, John Lindsay is the producer of the people uh, of the seal. Um, and John Lindsay passed on in February last month. And it was uh, quite uh, a hurtful uh, parting. He is done visiting this land, Tanarakaku, as we'd say in our, lang uh, our language. But he left a living legacy, and I am so, so grateful that he is one of those people that came to the Pribilof Islands, and he left with a longing to return. And with that longing to return, he was able to leave us the people of the seal that tells our story in a series of books that the uh, federal government printed and that are available for people to see. And I cannot express enough my gratitude uh, to John Lindsay for the work that he did. So, um, so what is the plan for the People of the Seal movie? Have you, are you going to, I guess, distribute it to schools or able to sell it on DVD or? Um, I would like to see People of the Seal provided to, if not every school in the United States, at least every school in the state of Alaska. Because for the most part, when people look at Alaska, they think gold rush. Um, and the whole fur rush history before that is missed. And all of the companies and all of the people that uh, were able to move through life co quite financially comfortably um, from that fur trade, uh, there are many stories to tell about that. It's just like a whole encyclopedia of information that's really awesome. So I do hope that, uh, and I have spoken with some folks to figure out how can we make this available to every school and how do we have a curriculum guide that goes with it so people know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And that is true about the, about the gold rush because the, the fur rush, I'd never even heard that phrase until you just said it. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it is absolutely something that's sort of, I guess glossed over might be, the, might be the wrong phrase, but it's not talked about as frequently as the gold rush or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like this movie might be a, a step in the right direction though to help people maybe open the doors for other filmmakers or other people who have stories to tell about, about their experience? Experiences. I do. I feel like People of the Seal has opened a door and just people just need to walk through them. There are some little bits and pieces of uh, history. The Sloss family is one that played a role in uh, the fur trade here in Alaska and on the Pribilof Islands. And there are pe members of that family that are always looking at ways to uh, improve the knowledge about that particular history. Someone just found in the basement uh, of uh, a place in Seattle, Washington, I believe it was, a bag of Alaska Commercial Company uh, logs from the 1800s that have to do with the fur industry. And they just had them printed on uh, CDs and to make that information available. So along the way, there, I feel like there will be more opportunities for that story to be told. And it's quite fascinating. Just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I was born on St. George Island, and I have, I'm, I feel like I'm a Pribilof Islands lifetimer. I don't know what will ever take me away. Um, I, my father was quite instrumental in ensuring that I be the one that um, learned the history of our people and the history of our place and the separations that there have been. I come from Unangan 
in most indigenous uh, cultures, you develop your society and your culture based on place. We have that. We were moved to the Pribilof Islands and it opened up, opened up a whole other chapter for those of us that were transplanted. And my father uh, was a Russian Orthodox priest and he always said that he appreciated that role and how it helped his people. And he basically said, here, I'm giving you this information because it is your role. Uh, and when he did that when I was like 13 or 14 and at the time I didn't want to have anything to do with it and it felt like I was carrying this burden of knowledge on my back and the more he gave me and I was able to build on that by the time I was in my late 20s and into my 30s it was a wealth of information and I appreciate him doing that. Now I'm trying to figure out how to pass it on without just holding it uh, in my own personal studies and not having anything written down developing a cultural website. So hopefully people can go and find out about who we are and then find out our story. And do you find that with the rise in technology and do you, do you find that the youth of, you know, the, the, the kids that live on Prib the Pribilof Islands, are they as interested in learning about their culture as maybe as you were? Or, or were, are they in that same kind of boat as you when you were 13, 14, not really wanting to... <laughs> Yeah, the children of the Pribilof Islands, and you know, I don't have as much interaction with children on St. George, where I was born, as I do with children on St. Paul. <clears throat> They're pretty modern. Um, and I think, I think um, they want to be like every other American uh, youngster and have the technology and be savvy in that way. And so hopefully, that's why I say, if we can use technology and put those, that information in their hands, what I've discovered is children that I have provided information for 15 or 20 years ago have come back 15 or 20 years later and said, I am so grateful you told me that. And it might, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but now I do. So it's an investment in their history, in a sense, um, to keep things going. They may not always want it, and it may be like spinach on their plates when they're eight or 10 years old, but let's keep it there and later it will nurture something in them that uh, they can keep the story going.